This lesson is um, on how evolution occurs, but how do we know that it is actually occurring? Um, the evidence that they're using to support these theories of, of Darwin and natural selection. A few, just a lot of vocabulary and some examples that follow. So I'll write the vocabulary definition, but also pay attention to the examples that you might want to write down so you can associate them. For if there's another example that I give you on a test, that you can use this example on the notes to somewhat apply to the one that's on the test. Homologous structures, um, we've seen the word homologous before in between or before the word chromosomes. And homologous chromosomes were two chromosomes that have the same size because they have the same genes on them, but they are different because they have different variations or alleles on them. So that term homologous is used again because it's a very similar structure to the definition. Um, homologous structures, just like chromosomes, you can't just look at one and say it's a homologous chromosome, it's a comparison. So homologous structures are structures when compared uh, between two different organisms that have a similar anatomical structure um, but have different functions and I doubt that you have any background knowledge on sorry type of uh, on these so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull up you know Google to, to show you what are the most common examples so if I put homologous structures it's one of the first ones to fill in um, and you see here a few of them a lot of these are appendages and if you look at the examples that they have they have some humans some cat whale bat the different functions is very easy to follow because they you understand that a bat flies a whale swims you know the the arms of a human cats walk you know and all the ones that you might be able to see up here there's some variations amongst them but what you have to pay close attention to is actually the coloration and they are trying to show even within the different parts or appendages they have the same anatomical structure the purple represents the humerus you have the blues and the yellows there is all a corresponding part even though they have different functions their interior anatomy is the same how does that lend itself to evolution but the fact that um we all have come from a common ancestor. So is it coincidence that we all have these different, these same structures? No, I think it's that they had a common ancestor and they've just changed through the millions of years. Analogous structures, thus very similar um, framework to the definition, but it's the complete opposite where analogous structures are structures that have the same function, but a different anatomical structure so it's the reverse so think of things that you're in your head thinking these two organs or parts do the same thing but they are clearly not from the same um, anatomical structure I asked that in class today and some students came up with lungs and gills so think of it like that where they both are used for breathing but the structure of a gill is definitely not anything like the lung so just to go back into this Google Doc or sorry, Google search to show you what is the most common example of analogous. So you see a lot of fins and wings here. So that's your most common. I think wings is actually more common on test examples. So if we look at the bat, once again, it has the same parts as the human, the humerus, the radius, the ulna, but these other insects that have the same function, which is flight or wings, the insect of a moth or butterfly do not, or any insect do not have the same anatomical structure but they serve the same purpose it's to fly so that would be examples of um, analogous structures now the third word here is vestigial and a vestigial structure vestigial means useless so these are structures that at one point served a function but are no longer needed in the current organism so think of an example off the top of your head. One of the most common examples is the appendix. So the appendix was one point used um, in the digestive system to break down different types of foods that were used or consumed way back when. Um, but through the years when our diet changed, so did our need for the appendix. Other common human examples would be the tailbone. Uh, no longer do we have a tail, but we have the tailbone. Things such as tonsils, things such as um, wisdom teeth students brought up, and technically, you have to say that they were used at one point, 
Uh, just because you can remove it and survive does not make it vestigial. It's more of an evolutionary tie to our past. So make sure that you have the example if you use, you have the connection to the past. I think some things, for example, your your tonsils, I believe, are still used in the immune system. So therefore, they wouldn't necessarily be a vestigial. If you have them, they might help you. It's not that they're useless. This next idea is embryonic development. So the picture that you see below uh, in yours, I think it's just a different version I have. But this picture shows different organisms across the horizontal right here. These are all organisms, eight different organisms at the same stage, early embryonic development. This middle row takes the look at what their embryos might look like kind of halfway through their development. And this final is what they look like right prior to birth. So how does this prove that evolution may have taken place? It's all about finding or proving that common ancestry happened. And so if we look back here at the first, this makes sense to say that if all these organisms, you would not be able to differentiate, if you can see the font, between humans and a turtle and a pig and a salamander way back when, because we are all too very similar to each other. It is only when they are somewhat at the last point of where they're going to be born that there is a huge differentiation between them, and you can start to see what they look like prior. Um, this just lends itself to evolution, saying that it, it did happen because one common ancestor, which is the whole theory of evolution, there was one common ancestor that has spawned all different species on this planet. You know, there, there are certain things that change rapidly and other things don't. And the early embryonic has not changed as much as the later outcomes. Uh, similar Similarities in macromolecules. We talked macromolecules way back in the beginning of the year with carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. But if we're looking for similarity in ancestry, we're going to look into the proteins. And because we're going to look at proteins, proteins are dictated because of the information that's in your nucleus. So therefore, we can kind of say DNA is another type of macromolecule or nucleic acid that we can look for similarities. So think of it along the lines of if you have a protein that is similar amongst organisms, such as the most common example is hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a protein found in the blood, but it's homologous. Uh, amongst organisms, it's not the same amino acid sequence. So therefore, if we can find uh, a comparison between two organisms and say we look at the amino acid sequence between a human versus that chicken in the previous example, or the human versus the, the pig, and we look at what the overlap is for amino acids in this hemoglobin protein. If the sequence comparison between the human and the chicken were, was like a 72% overlap and the human and the pig was an 84, then we, we can deduce through this idea that maybe our common ancestor to the pig is more closely, is more, is closer to present day than it was between the human and the chicken. We're going to be doing an activity that, that somewhat uses this concept and we'll get some data and try and find out organisms based on their comparison amongst organ, uh, macromolecules. So if a protein such as hemoglobin is different, we can backtrack that to the protein was made because of an mRNA sequence and that mRNA sequence was made because of a DNA. So we can conclude that the DNA structure also would be a 72 and 84% difference as well for that potential uh, gene. So those are four, five pieces of things that they somewhat group together to say this is evidence that evolution has happened. The next piece are patterns of evolution, so skipping through. Um, co-evolution, the prefix co, we've seen with maybe co-dominance where both things show through. This is when two or more species change in response to one another. For example, predator and prey. If the prey gets faster, the predator needs to as well. They need to change with each other. If the predator gets faster, the prey, only the ones that survive will be faster. So it's this, this back and forth that if one gets better, the other, the only ones that will survive will be the ones that were at the top of their game at that moment. Other examples uh, are pollinators and the flowers. They somewhat evolve together as well. Some flowers are built specifically for pollinators. If one changes the, the ones that change with it or the ones that had the mutation. You can't necessarily just will yourself to change. That's hopefully something to, to recognize. Things have to happen by chance. Um, nature has to select certain characteristics now in a new environment, all those things. So that's co-evolution. 
convergent evolution um, when two actually I'm going to reword that when the environment selects a specific feature or features then mul multiple organisms kind of resemble each other that doesn't mean that organisms are going to start to merge together as one species that will never happen but for example if you want to be an aquatic organism many aquatic organisms have a very streamlined body shape they're not box like it doesn't it doesn't work for that environment so the environment has shaped what is most successful in that environment so that would be a good example of convergent where whales and sharks and dolphins they all kind of look the same because that that body frame is what makes them successful in that environment um, divergent evolution is kind of the reverse so if you know converge means to to merge together but diverge is to go further apart this is when um, a species or multiple species becomes more dissimilar over time. So this is when one species, maybe they were, two organisms were separated for such a long time that they didn't interact with each other. We'll talk about what that can cause. But divergent evolution is when one organism might split into two different species or species just become further and further apart from one another. So that idea when we had a common ancestor with the primates, at some point we had to diverge. We are no longer the same species as the chimpanzee, the monkey, the ape. That happened because of divergent evolution. Divergent evolution is a more broad concept, whereas adaptive radiation is very, very similar. It's actually under the umbrella of divergent. This would be a common or more broad term. This is of a specific form of divergent evolution. In our intro class, we're not necessarily going to differentiate that much between them, if at all. I kind of will use them as more synonyms to each other, but I want you to recognize both words just in case I don't want to focus on one word and the other word is used on a state exam. So adaptive radiation is a single ancestral species changes over time. The example for this is Darwin's finches. They started as one type of finch, and because they migrated to different islands, they didn't interact with each other. The island shaped which organisms survived, so the ones that had the correct shaped beak would be the ones that pass on those genes. So therefore, adaptive radiation is just a specific form of divergent evolution. On you know, my test, I, I will not give you choice A, divergent evolution, and choice B, adaptive radiation. Um, I would use one or the other, just recognize that they are, in essence, very, very similar to one another. In an advanced class, maybe they'll differentiate between them a little further. So that's what you need to know for these two topics, um, and I'm going to end the video.